All right. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Anthony. Hey, thank you very much for having me on, man. It's a pleasure. You broke, uh, I broke my one rule, which is don't learn about my guests before they come on the show so I could talk to them and have free flow. And then you sent me your book, and then I read the first little page of it, and it said mysticism, and I'm like, well, okay, what what do you, what, what defines you, Anthony? Um, I, That's a good question. I, I try not to... Um, I try not to, you know, uh, fit myself into any boxes in particular, but um, I am, I don't know, I was, because I was, uh, uh, people ask me this sometimes, and, you know, I'm not, the first things off, I'm not like a, a particularly religious person, and I'm not uh, a new agey person either, but I've always, you know, I was, I was raised Christian, but I, uh, I just have a more philosophical mindset these days. I'm very much inspired by, you know, like the psychoanalyst Carl Jung, where he took the approach of um, um, setting aside essentially a lot of the metaphysics, like just as example, and just kind of encapsulates how I, uh, like how I view my work in general. Um, you could, uh, the idea of God, you could set aside whether or not God's real um, and and just learn a lot from the observations of how people react to that belief in good and bad ways. So I find uh, belief in general to be a very fascinating thing. And I have my own beliefs, but I also, you know, part of the, like the subtitle of the book, the book I wrote, Dive Manual, Empirical Investigations of Mysticism. So it tries to, uh, all my work is uh, grounded in empiricism, you know, to, to some things that you uh, can experience through the senses, essentially. So I think like I'm not a religious person either, but I have family that's pretty heavily religious. And I understand where it's needed, like faith wise, it's good to have faith. But like the religion that's shown so much, at least going to church and doing all these things kind of it's out of my realm, I would say, mostly yeah. like. I'm a more in belief of like, if you will something into the universe, or if you know, like, not like praying, you're going to get a million dollars and it shows up at your door. But if you start having a more of a positive outlook, then more positive things are going to happen to you rather than harping on the negatives. You start kind of questioning is like, especially from talking to so many people that do psychedelics and talk about like, it's God is all everything. And it's like, it really boils down to like the universe seems to be giving off its own energy. Everybody's working off their own frequency and right. everything. Like if, if that's what God is, then it, you start to kind of raise questions to a lot of things of like, well, then why wouldn't God want me to eat meat on a Thursday? Why would God <laughs> give a shit about that? And that's not to dismiss that religion, but like you start, like I've talked to so many people now that are ex what they call cultists. And they were mm -hmm. people that were Jehovah's witnesses that are no longer Jehovah's witnesses. And it's like, they're telling you how to believe. And then if you start questioning, they excommunicate you, then you can't speak to your family. I'm like, that's not what God would want. If we have this idea of a being that created us, want us to be happy. Correct. So it's like, you start to go through your head of like, Oh my God. And then it's like opening up a band aid That's not supposed to be ripped off yet. You're like, do I go down this rabbit hole? I don't know. Right. Right. I, I think those, uh, sometimes people are, um, they're timid about going down those rabbit holes and because they're uh, afraid of the whatever uncertainty they might find there. But I think that those are healthy. And um, yeah, you know, I, if anything, like in the long run, some of my biggest inspirations are things like Buddhism and uh, yeah, like Chinese Taoism and stuff. I like, uh, so I, I'm like a, I'm kind of like a metaphysical minded person, but I don't get hung up on, a lot. I feel like the the two big things that people always get hung up on is, and what I always get asked, and uh, and not that you ask, which is cool, um, and not that there's a problem with asking either, but uh, it's just the how often it comes up. But do you believe in God, and like what is the meaning of life? Like, does some, in a way, those are the wrong questions. There's so many more questions to ask, and there's so much more out there, even in like metaphysically speaking. Because uh, again, I. I don't, I try not to get too wooey with it, but the point in the long run that I kind of like to, or that my work touches on a lot is um, that when you follow, you know, the trail of breadcrumbs, like whether it be psychedelics or your own dreams, like analyzing that or 
you know, pivotal points in your life or expressing yourself through art. Um, there are different aspects of life, however you want to define those aspects that are beyond the material. Um, and it's important to engage with those things, like, you know, the subjective and the objective, just because something is subjective um, and not like it's necessarily tangible uh, doesn't mean it's or useless. And, uh, and, you know, for that matter, a lot of my work gets into, so we could, there's really a lot that we could talk about. Uh, we could go in a lot of different directions, whatever you find interesting, but it's not just like mysticism stuff. Uh, that's what the book is a lot about, but a lot of my work, especially like with upcoming stuff and different podcasts I talk about, I do just research in general and it goes into, you know, some, uh, some like true crime stuff. Uh, I mean, I'm very interested in cults and, uh, Oh, what about cults, please? I've, I, uh, I found out my buddy in a podcast was a cult leader at one point and I had no clue. I'm not talking about, uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about ex cultist. I'm talking about he legit is in Arizona and he was getting like women sent to him, cars sent to him, all these things. And wow. he didn't realize, cause it's so hard. See, here's the issues why like you can see someone that says like, Oh, religion's a cult. It's because you believe it so much that you don't want anything to question it. But then once you kind mm -hmm. of like this idea of once you get out of it and start noticing, like I think the education system's a cult, the fucking <laughs> pledge of allegiance. What is yeah. that for? one point in the day i would get up put my hand over my chest and i would recite this speech that is cult type things and for you sure. start to look at stuff like for me i value experience in the most ways probably anybody could ever value experience and that is the fact that if i talk to a 70 year old monk or i talk to a person that's maybe 20 years old and experienced a hard life you start to realize the information that they can give you are insights or perspective that can only enhance your own i don't think we are supposed to be built up with just one perspective. We're supposed to handle right. every single perspective, but the issue is the way that we're handling it is like, if I, I use this example, if you're mining like ore out of a vein or something in a wall, and then you hit it and a leak comes in, instead of saying, okay, now my hole is filling up with water. I need to find a way to get out. You go, well, might as well fucking hit it again. And then you fucking hit it again. And then more water comes in. You're taking too much in rather than processing it. And then you end up becoming overloaded with so much information. You start having these breaks and freak outs where you're trying to like spray paint somebody or do something insane. <laughs> yeah. Very good points. Yeah. Um, um, and people like to think that, um, you know, religion definitely has its uses. I, I, I appreciate a person's on a, I appreciate people on an individual basis, but when things get organized, I get squeamish pretty quickly. Um, and uh, so I, that's honestly why I like to use the term mysticism rather than religious. Mysticism from the scholastic definition being, um, that there is this um, divine, quote unquote, and we can get into divine a little bit because it's, you know, I, I, I keep things grounded. I like to uh, consider psycholo uh, uh, psychological principles more, uh, before getting into really wooey stuff. But um, the idea that whatever speaks to you, whatever is divine, whether that's God or that's uh, like nature in the long run, you know, whatever whatever your ideals are essentially, um, that you can access that on your own terms rather than going to a priest or uh, someone uh, like a higher, cl this classist kind of mentality. And not that there's wrong with going and getting um, expert advice or you know trusted counsel. Um, I think that that's great, but the whole idea that uh, the priest class, not just in Christianity, uh, but especially in Christianity, um, they, they, they kind of have like lock and key on a lot of it. Um, and yeah, that's it, largely uh, a lot of what I'm against for sure. Um, but, but like I said, I really appreciate people's, um, um, you know, I think that there's a, there's a lot of use in, 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 I've read a lot of different religious mystical kind of texts and um, 
they're all dated, of course, they're ancient, but, uh, but yeah, there's use in all of them for sure. I think there's, everyone's got a little piece to the same puzzle and mm-hmm. it's, it's not just, oh, well, here's the puzzle. It's like, no, 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 you have a small fragment of that puzzle. Like every single religion hits on certain core principles that are all the same, but they have just different minor things to it. This is why I start saying right. social media is a little bit of a cult because you are <laughs> gathering followers. You are trying to do some things, but the weird part is the classifications of it all is that me and you could start maybe the same podcast and talk about true crime, but then you want to talk about true crime strictly in this certain area. And I want to talk about true crime specifically in this area. And this is now where we branch off and start our own divisions, which will build up followers, depending on if someone wants to listen to yours and based on that location and mine based on whatever location, where I start looking at things like, man, is it possible? And I think what you're trying to say, too, is the fact of like you you have your own interpretation and experience on what you feel like you need to be doing, which is known as what is divine to you as a person. You know what I hold to be divine in my eyes on the and that word divine just gets so like everyone thinks like you're thinking of like mosaics and like stuff that you see at a church or something like that. Right. But what means to you or what can touch your soul and bring you to the closest interpretation of finding this peace, I would say, exactly. which would be yeah. nature for me for sure, but also community. There's a very big community aspect in a lot of the ways that people function that more than we realize, I think. I mean, they talked about, I read an article saying that the suicide rates for COVID were down. And I was like, what, what what's your evidence on that? And then the article says, well, everyone was so compassionate and helping each other. I was like, for the first two weeks, yes. And then everyone became a dick again. Because yeah. when you, you – this is why I think inherently in our bodies, we have an initial uh, skill or trait about caring for one another. We initially mm-hmm. care down to a very core thing, but it gets clouded by a lot of the messages and things that are going on in the world that lose us from that interaction with ourselves and the others around us. So when something dangerous, like a terroristic act, like a 9-11 or something, we all come together in that time because we realize we need to come together to really build ourselves back up. But then once we lose that fear, we lose that threat, we get the sense of comfortability, we start trying to dig into each other's lives where we're not really caring about each other anymore. And we're more about taking the other person down, which is a trait from society. And that, I know that's a mouthful, but that's, it's, it's so clear in so many actions in the world, whether it's someone coming together to be able to hang out and then getting in an argument over something like politics, you're letting something getting in the way of the feelings and the emotion that you have for someone based on something they saw that was projected to them and their own interpretation of that. And that's where I start looking at things like you see issues with people interpreting the Bible or any religious text. Oh, I don't agree with that's what it means. Well, that's why that's that in person's interpretation. You're so supposed to value it right yeah uh the the art of debate is uh trick not me. entirely but it's pretty lost these days yeah. and it's unfortunate because uh debate's a healthy thing and it's it's really important and valuable to be able to um test different kinds of viewpoints without having i don't know with a you know, it's okay to be wrong. Like I've always looked at like being wrong is getting closer to the truth. Like this, it's okay. You know, you're, you're, uh, it's not, um, but I know people really have their egos tied up in it and that's what it's boiled down to. Um, but, uh, I really, I always enjoy debating. Um, um, and I noticed that, um, a lot of people um, just like to argue. They don't really like to debate. And there's a fine line, but there's a huge difference. It's kind of um, fun though, when you can kind of like get into a little heated thing with somebody, but the issue is just like, it always ends badly. Like if you watch- right. like ben There's Shapiro, no like good game at the end. Like, yeah, I was like, oh, right, you know, well, that's, that's and, what you want. You want an intellectual chess match. Exactly. Where there is no fist fighting at the ending, but all these debates now turn into, I need to ruin this person's life. I need to do this. I need to do that. And it always needs to go like the extra step. And it's like, when I watch- a Ben Shapiro when he's like shutting down someone. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the stuff he says, but I can see his perspective on things. Yeah, sure. 
But when you're watching it happen, it's like all these people that are asking him questions are just trying to take him down because they feel like they can do it. Like even with Steven Crowder, they're trying to take him down. And I'm like, you have good points. He has good points. You guys are looking at the same thing in two completely different ways. And it starts to, you know, people go, well, I agree with everything he says. This is where we start separating it into parties. And I'm like, we're, that's not what's supposed to be. We're all supposed to be working here to survive together. I watch debates about um, vegans versus meat eaters. Now, mm -hmm. myself, Ooh. I'm not vegan. I eat meat, but I don't eat red meat. I only eat fish. Um, I live in a beach town, so red meat's just so far out of grasp for me. I just I, – everything down here is seafood, which I love. I love eggs too. Um, but when I watch a vegan and they talk about like, you know, if a mountain lion was going to kill your family or something like that, you would kill that mountain lion. And that's always the examples sure. uh, meat people use. But if you think about their perspective of it is you are entering into that animal's home, you are encroaching onto its space. So if it has a right to attack you because you're in its home, you're not supposed to be there. It, there's you see the perspective of things on it too and you see mm -hmm. hey i'm not gonna let someone kill my kid yeah i'm like yeah i see that perspective too but it always gets so heated and then there's i'm not listening i'm not listening and it turns into, and that happens with every major topic that we have today and i'm like guys what the fuck no change is getting done all we're doing right. is arguing and bitching and then forgetting about it an hour later and then wondering, well, we still need to fix this. And then the argument starts again. You're not fixing the issue. Food, starvation, all these things are going on in our government, religious, whatever you want to talk about. That is a very big problem that the world is just trying to skip 10 steps and hit that. Why don't you right. focus on the things that lead up to that? Like if a person talks about like, um, let's – my buddy, uh, he worked at the FedEx place that was um, had the giant shooting that happened. Oh, wow. Instead of trying to ban guns, which there are cases where it's like, yeah, I can see your points on that. Why don't you lead up to the core problems that are causing people to use guns or causing this anger or causing this pain that society is obviously feeling? If you're talking about a number of gun deaths, if you're talking about a number of suicides, what the fuck is leading up to that? Making mm -hmm. people that are going to talk to other people about suicide is good, but why is that becoming an issue? What is going on in their life? You know, I studied psychology, but you also know by analyzing things with psychology, you can understand that a lot of environmental influences lead into a person's behavior. There's Big environmental, time. there's genetic, there's so many different psychological theories that can affect a person's life. So why don't you like – um? Biggest one, I went to school for chemical dependency and ended up switching to psychology. I started realizing when someone said that rehabs were like a money scheme. And I was like, what's what's your perspective on that? And Dr. Carl Hunt, I think his name is, um, he talked about how like they're there to treat you for heroin. If you're turning to a drug and it's heroin because you lost your life or you lost your home, they get you off heroin. Then you come home and still see all that stuff is gone. You turn to a different drug. Treat the core issue of the problem right. and you will see change. And I'm like, fucking true. How much stuff in your life where, okay, you're sad because this happened. So I'm going to buy this. You're happy for the time being, but are you going to stay happy until you need to buy another thing to make you happy again? It's fixing those core steps rather than trying to target what you're feeling at that moment. Look at what's giving you that pain. Look at what you need to fix to make sure that pain doesn't happen again or continue. That's to me, that was like, oh my God, like you start looking at it like, holy shit, like it's like the roadmap gets uncovered from your eye. You get to see the whole thing. Like it. I know where Denny's is now, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> I, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, it, that's so crucial uh, because addiction is where you can see a really prime example, but that is that pretty much getting to the core of things, like you said, and finding the underlying patterns. That's um, such a huge aspect of life itself, really. And um, that is, I mean, that really is like kind of, again, just to kind of put a, a cherry on the top of, uh, some of the airy terms I've tossed around, like that is divinity in the long run is getting in touch with that. Um, 
deeper aspect of yourself so that you can um because it's not just this uh this all internal personal thing it's once you you know by growing you know and um expanding as a person you are more equipped to help others in your life you know it's uh, it's all a, a reciprocal thing and um um very hard because the world likes to put something in a classification and trying to set out let's team up or let's pick teams and i mean i think iner- inherently in the beginning that was a good thing you know when it talked about like yeah we're cavemen and we're trying to figure out okay we're people they're animals they're trying to kill us and we need to get weapons okay that makes a little bit of sense you know b- breaking up into groups to help survive we're taking down a woolly mammoth or something you get 10 people is going to be easier than just using one uh, but then you look at the fact of now people are trying to split into classifications based on ethnicities, based on all these things, and which I, I'm i supportive of the movements, whatever you want to talk about. But when I see the news and the news classifies to me, uh, a certain ethnicity was shot rather than saying a person had just lost their life. That's where we've gone wrong. You should look at that as a human soul that is now officially off this planet. Mm -hmm. And rather than looking at it like, well, this person of this ethnicity and this and you're just making, I understand you want it to be 100% detailed, but you're not helping in the eyes of how people are already trying to isolate themselves from other people based on the fact of they're different this way. And everyone wants to be different now, which I think you should be. A lot of people are uniquely different, but we're so much more similar too. I think we all have this compassion. I don't think if you ask any person or a reasonable person, would you want to see a kid die? Would you want to see a person die? What'd they do? Well, they're just a person. There's a good person that died. Oh my God. That's horrible. Yeah. Why are we fucking labeling it down to like, well, this person died. Well, what did he do? Well, I mean, he had a, he stole a candy bar and then... Oh, that reasonalize it. No, it doesn't. It's a fucking person dead. It's like there's a bigger thing that wants you to have a compassion for others rather than – and if that's the universe, a hum that we all on this same frequency, let's all get on that frequency. Fuck 5G, that thing messing with your brainwaves, whatever you want to talk about. But find yeah. that frequency that can connect us on a level of like I'm not hurting your energy and you're not hurting mine. We're both reciprocating, right. but no, no exchange of pain is being done here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, that's, um, that's why um, cults are so fascinating. Uh, I mean, because talking about like outliers in society and prime examples of things, um, it, it's, uh, you know, the way I see it is there is a little bit of cult aspect in all religions just like there's a little bit of religious aspects in all cults and um it's just kind of uh which scale tips over more in in that equation to make it to make a group one or the other and uh yeah you see that nothing uh, don't get me wrong i'm not uh saying that like good and bad are all relative but nothing is quite so clean cut because you see um especially in cults um just taken to the uh, the the most extremes um they hook people in with um reasonable initial food for thought oftentimes and uh and and then uh slowly slowly the trail of breadcrumbs leads them further and further until you know the cult leader gets to the point where they're god and um it just goes hey, it's usually some murders and things from there and it goes haywire um you would think that if you were a cult leader i get the power aspect because i think once you put someone in a position of power they never want to give that up um it's just it's it's so hard it's like if i told right. you you're gonna live off a billion dollars a year and then i bring you down to a hundred dollars it's not right. gonna be look what happens with form. communism yeah. yeah but if you look at like it never ends well when you start mm-hmm. considering yourself God. It always ends in a bad way. What do you typically find, I guess, what cult experience or what cult thing have you researched or looked into you find interesting? And then what do you focus on it? Because, like, I liked um, – I think it was Heaven's Gate. Mm-hmm. Um, but I looked at the angle of, like, what could get someone to a point in their life where they feel like they need this and this resonates so much with them. That they want to put a bag over their head 
asphyxiate themselves while wearing a fresh new pair of Nikes was the weirdest thing that pointed out to me where I'm like, what happened in these individuals lives that can get you sucked up? Because I think a lot of people are in a cult and don't know it. But then that was like a clear, obvious one where it was like, what pushed you to that point of like this person felt so like as- askewed or uh, in, in, I guess, yeah, excluded in their life that they needed to join something like this and feels like it really resonated something where they fit in. And to me, that was like, I need to look at that environmental history of that person. Yeah, yeah. Um, I could definitely say that I um, am interested in the same questions. And, uh, and overall, I just fascinated in uh, belief and um, what people get out of it, because there is a point that people get to where they feel on some level the psychological need to invest themselves into something because however short-sighted it might be, there's something to gain at least in the moment, like whether it be community or just at least an initial sense of well-being or whatever. And then, um, but so I'm, I'm always curious in that. Um, and, and, and then obviously uh, in so far as a cult is concerned, I'm also very curious in where it goes wrong. And, um, so often the, sometimes cults, you know, sometimes there's the more sadistic cults for sure, but, um, so often it's just the, uh, the, to continue just um, snowball effects like psychopathy of the cult leader that really just throws things out of whack. And so I'm also very much interested in the actual cult leader uh, persona as well, because I see it as like, as well as serial killers in the sense of, um, I mean, to kind of, because all of my, uh, my brain always kind of brings it back to like um, psychology and mysticism as psychology so i'm always interested in like you know the, you people toss around the term archetypes and things and so like what drives people and what is their like inner narrative their own like internal neurological mythology and the story that they're projecting into the world and um so in a case of like a you know like a buddhist example there's the whole refinement quality to yourself it, well if you look at things like uh cult leader uh, or a successful cult leader particularly or a serial killer um it what are we it literally seems like the ex- on? <laughs> huh so what are we basing successful on um so someone able to guile people i guess because there are some who there are plenty who try and they're not good at it and they're just they just uh, sam sad. elliott could be a good uh cult leader i'm telling you his voice is like butter yeah, 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 yeah. I every once in a while I'll have that thought too, especially having researched cults. You come across a figure in the media who's like magnetic, like for good reason. They're they're good at what they do, and they're like, man, it's a good thing they're not a cult leader because they could be if they wanted to. <laughs> you could literally, like, I mean, you're talking about the psychology aspect of things. Like when you look at a serial killer, for instance, the one thing I found fascinating is I was watching this video, and it was this guy, and um, he didn't kill his mom. Uh, but his mom, he's being tried for murder for killing his mom and he didn't do it. Someone else did. So they were asking him like, what, like, Hey, why'd you kill your mom? He's like, I didn't. And it was like this sense of like, he had no empathy or no like remorse for doing the act. So they thought he was insane and they put him in an insane asylum because like, that's part of being like, when they figure out if you're insane, they do a psychology test on you. It's like, oh my God, this person does not know what he did wrong. So he must be insane, which in cases there are people like that. Like you see a serial killer. It's like, I don't feel any sadness for it. I was happy to do it. And you're like, oh, you don't know what right and wrong is. It's crossed in your brain. Like of Mm -hmm. what? That happened somewhere in your life that must have happened. But they ended up finding the real killer, and then he got released after five years in an insane asylum. And he was like, I told you I didn't do it. But it's so hard because you can't – it's so hard to diagnose or be able to figure out if a person is telling the truth or if a person is just mentally insane. You know, you can implant implant false memories into your own head. Like you could be like, remember that basketball game me and you went to? And you're like – what basketball game i started giving you a perfect detailed description like oh my god i guess we did do that but i forgot about it yeah my memory's better it's like oh (laughs) yeah 
it gets crazy, man, because you look at like what leads someone to start a cult, probably because most of their life they were secluded from something and they couldn't like people picked on them. People did a bunch of stuff. And now they have a place of power where they get to control a bunch of people that they, he likes to think that are below him. And instead of thinking on the same level, he starts ordering people what to do. And then that's when it gets insane. Instead of like, hey, man, let's get more members. It turns into get me an iced tea from the fridge. And it's like, what? It's like, I am your leader. Do what I mm -hmm. say. And then that demon comes in. You're like, oh, here we go. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, and, uh, you know, on that note, like with with cults in general, um, you know, people. You, sometimes you hear because there's a lot of people who, who actually will look into cults. I've looked into a bunch of different kinds. I wouldn't call myself a I wouldn't write a book. On You're not in a cultist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but I do. I, I've, I've perused a lot of uh, the different stories of all these crazy cults, and uh, um, yeah, there's, it's uh, there's so many, and um, yeah, like I said, you can see how people could get hooked in, and uh, uh, but there's always this, um, um, this like oh i almost lost my train of thought there i remember though um uh the idea that like you know people get wrapped up in the panic um especially like you know the satanic panic seems it seems like there's a 2.0 on the rise and uh and people so when people think of cults they think of like human sacrifice and and worshiping the devil and things and you know for the record there have been some of them out there they're not particularly organized but i mean there's been all kinds of cults out there but really the vast majority are all uh christian sects gone awry which is really curious to think about um it, it, specifically in the west i mean uh where all of the 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 worst of the worst they all start it's like they they lure people in with information that people are familiar with on some level and then they flip it um like you know jim jones started out as like this new age kind of christian uh thing uh, l ron hubbard um uh definitely used uh some like esoteric christian elements with scientology and uh the, because of scientology there were offshoots of uh different cults that all began to incorporate aliens and meditation and different things and i'm just smiling um, right now because i have i accidentally opened it's like opening up a, jo a door for jehovah's witness they end up never leaving you alone and somehow i've accidentally stumbled across a couple of scientology people on the podcast and then <laughs> now there's just random accounts that follow me always asking about scientology and always asking like oh no studying my stuff so they're going to get a kick out of you mentioning it um <laughs> Hopefully they won't find you, but it's interesting because like, oh God. what do you call it? Um, when you're looking at like, just like cults, for instance, everyone has this idea from a movie version of what a cult is, where you're sacrificing a chicken and wearing a hood, but mm. then you don't realize the other ones around you that aren't necessarily bad ones. There's probably good cults out there. Like if I was a cult leader, I'd start one with morals where I was like, yeah, don't be a dick to someone else. And do your thing, I guess, but, you know, just worry about yourself. Honestly, that's the best cult. Worry about yourself. Um, but it, it it's so hard because that word has such a packful wallop to it, I would say. Like you said, per, mm -hmm. uh, per you said per rooting, per rooting, I think you said. I don't know what word. You used I a can't. really good word a minute ago, and I was like, I got to write that shit down. I can't remember. What, pervasive? You said perusing perusing there you yeah go. that's yeah. a fucking wallop of a word where if someone <laughs> hears that it's like damn that's a good one um and that's with cults it has such a packful thing to it where you hear it it's like oh and immediately it's like this dark cloud comes into the room where you're like oh my god not necessarily all cults are prop there probably are some good ones out there there's probably some like that you want freemasons for instance probably started out really bad but from what I've heard of it, it's kind of like a fraternity with a lot of guys, like a lot of firefighters in my area are, are they just like the brotherly, like going down to the pub and getting a pint of beer or something like that. I'm like, OK, well, that's not really bad. You just want to hang out. Right. That's see, it's just so sketchy, man. It's just 
that, that maybe it needs a new word. Like, don't call yourself a cult. Call yourself like a group, the Backstreet Boys. I don't give a shit. Just, just <laughs> something that doesn't sound like you're wearing a hood and you're splattering chicken blood on something. Yeah, yeah. Masonry is interesting um, because it gets a bad rap for good reason in some cases, but there's also a, a really respectable... Um, uh, there are definitely respectable aspects to it because it's kind of like a church or any religion in so far as there's like a, a vague overarching thing that ties them all together. But each like church or temple or for Masons, each lodge is run independently. So you get some like the, uh, it seems like the further you get up into the uh, the elite the weirder and weirder masonry gets but there's a lot of um there's a lot of you know like regular people who are masons too and Secret there's all I had, in between I had, I had the leader of the uk one of the pubs down there uh, one of the lodges the leader on here and he was talking about it he didn't get super detailed like i wanted him to but i'll get him back on to talk more about it but yeah, yeah. secret hands i'm like fuck yeah i'm down with that doing the high five and the when you have to go up to a door and say knock on it three times and then spin the drywall and the thing fucking opens that's awesome but then when it gets down to like you gotta pay to get a better subscription i'm like i don't even want to pay for a fucking youtube membership like right to skip ads i'll fucking deal with the two minute ad on colon cancer i don't give a shit but that's see, there's a line that needs to be drawn on some of these things. And I'm like, you can probably do it in a good beneficial way where it's bringing a community a little bit together, but it never ends up that way. It ends up going a little bit too far. Like the guys that chop their balls off for the bebop comment. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yeah. Wh what guy back there had to be one dude that was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like this was fun when we were doing bingo night and shit, but this just went a little too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um and uh yeah the further it goes um yeah there's that line of like extremism in religion where like where does like re extreme religious thought just become straight like cult mentality and uh it's a fine line and there's a whole conversation to be had about it um but uh um well, yeah what you know i don't I'll about oh, go what, ahead what exactly got you to this point where you decided that you wanted to write and you wanted to learn more about this stuff like yeah you can i just couldn't picture you sitting down and be like i should write a book on this like did you have a dream did you have a psychedelic experience did you have this like come to grips moment yeah um i had a and there's like um i I've, I've had weird, uh, different weird experiences that have just um, given me weird interest in life. Like I, there was one particular moment that I talk about in the book where um, I had, and just a, this happens to a lot of people. Uh, so I don't even think it's particularly rare. And I definitely don't think you can control it or anything, but you know, sometimes uh, I, like in my case, you can have, um, like a, a dream that seems irrelevant at first, but then it happens later and it did it. There's all sorts of, uh, um, you know, that got me into like dream analysis uh, from like a psychological perspective and what you can understand about the symbols in your dreams. Um, what was your dream? Cause I had one, I literally just mentioned on the episode I released today about, um, I had a dream. I'm not religious, but I had a dream about Jesus Christ and, it sounds so dumb. Like I told someone at work and they're like, that's an SNL skit. And I'm like, no, it's, it was just, I, I, I'm an insomniac. So I've studied sleep heavily on trying to figure out what that is. My buddy sleeps with his eyes open. I'm like, what's this? So if you tell me your dream, I'll tell you mine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so long story short, I, uh, when I was like 17, I had, uh, I was in military school and I had this dream of, um, being at this really trippy, like, like PT Barnum side. So sideshow circus kind of uh, carnival and um, just really like surreal. And um, I met someone there and um, I, I ended up, uh, I talked to her a little bit and I lost her in the crowd and I was trying to find her. And 
And then I met her later, uh, like two months later, I'd never seen, there, there would have been no way that I could have ever seen her before or known anybody that would have. And uh, it was, it was not just meeting somebody, it was um, um, meeting her caused me to ask a lot more questions and just get deeper down the rabbit hole of uh, belief and metaphysics and things. But it wasn't just that either. Um, I also, um, I've seen, uh, I grew up in Alaska. I'm here in California now in the Bay Area, but in Alaska, um, I saw, I had a handful of really wild UFO sightings, uh, some with people. So uh, that caused me to um, uh, just start uh, wondering about that too and that's a whole conversation um fuck my dream what what about the ufo sightings tell me about a ufo sighting please i would uh i would love to hear your dream of course but i'll definitely tell you about the ufo sighting um oh my uh, so, god this is way better than my dream i just had a burrito with jesus christ at a taco bell that doesn't mean anything <laughs> that's pretty cool though <laughs> <laughs> i spent um, most of it trying to win a free burrito by spinning the thing to get the quarter down onto the burrito tab that's that's honestly uh, like a fun. I could I could see that being an SNL. Site, it was but, terrible but, in my eyes. But no lie, that seems um, that seems like genuine significance. You know, there's poignant symbolism in there. Like uh, Jesus seemed like a cool dude. Seemed like a smart guy. He um, didn't rush me. He was sitting at the table, and I sat down with some tacos in front of me, and I was just like, "You didn't get anything." And he goes, "You need less than you think you do." And I was just like, "Okay." Damn. And then a bur a burrito hits the table. And he bites into it and it's just beans. And I'm like, is that just a bean burrito? And he's like, everything that I have is everything that I need. And I'm like, what? And then he goes, he bites into it again. And I see avocado and I'm like, is that avocado? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, you're a psychopath. Cause I just hate avocados. <laughs> and then he just goes, Oh Lord. And he rolls his eyes. And then I'm like, are you calling your dad? And then the dream, like it, like a flash happened and I just fucking woke up. So I was just like, all right, that was, but there was like a good, couple hours where i was just messing trying to get a free burrito and then before we actually parked at the taco bell we're driving in this car and i'm looking out the window so i don't know it's jesus yet i just am staring out a window looking at all the countryside and the land keeps changing and terraforming like years and years in front of my eyes and i'm like what is life and he's like life is whatever you make it but it is your own you can choose to have a good one or a bad one and i'm like that's some fucking some fortune cookie knowledge and i turn over and i'm like you're jesus christ and he's like yeah you hungry and i'm like i could eat and it goes from there tell me about your ufo experience yeah that, i like that um um so um i'll i'll give you the rundown and i'll go into because there's a handful of them never saw any ets or anything like that but uh i'll yeah i'll break it down for you real quick uh because it's it takes some turns um because the first time uh, I saw it and this is the only the first time I saw it I was on mushrooms and that was the only time that I was ever under the influence uh, seeing these things but it's weird to note that the first time is completely ambiguous and would be a total throwaway I mean more or less is but I saw the same things afterward completely Maybe that sober. opened the door though that's what I'm thinking yeah yeah see and this is the other thing that um, I'll definitely tell you about the sightings but as a like a quick disclaimer, I'm very interested in UFOs and I'm open to whatever because no one has the full answer. It was but in I'm our definitely fucking COVID bill about aliens. Don't die. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the all the Pentagon stuff is starting to get pretty next level. And I'm of the opinion, like my best, you know, my best bet in Vegas type thing. I think that uh, there's something going on there, but I'm the guess that the it's it might be like a lot more metaphysical like you ever hear the term uh like ultra terrestrial you know like the idea of yeah like dimensional stuff that's where my mind likes uh and, and and that's where my mind goes with the uh with the really surrealist phenomena and then i think that there's probably a lot of as well uh like a really crazy black budget government tech and uh when you get into ufology sifting between the two is ufology if if you're interested in it it's great but if you're trying to get a clear-cut answer it's a headache because there's like hypnotherapy and all sorts of stuff and it, it can get really ambiguous and so you have to be patient and um know that there's going to be some loose ends and look for those loose ends but uh so but it, so there's that but in terms of my experiences 
yeah, like I said, first time mushrooms. And it was like, it was always a triangle. And the second time, I'll describe the second time I saw it and, and just know that I saw the same thing on the mushrooms. And I was alone for this time. And it was oh, like at like two o'clock. I was like smoking a little bit of weed, but I'm a little bit of a stoner. I just had a little bit of a buzz. Um, and I see this thing come over the tree line because I'm in Alaska at the time. And so there's like a, just a small forest in my backyard. And I think it's like a street light from a, from a parking lot on the other side. And, uh, but I see it come closer and it's this giant white orb and it's getting closer really fast, but it's silent and there's, everyone else is asleep. It's pitch black out and it gets like, it's just over my rooftop. I'm like, like an extra few stories above my rooftop in the, uh, in the neighborhood now. And it's a triangle except it has the tip cut off and it has um, red, blue and white lights and it, like an airplane, but it was, I had to like rub my eyes because I thought for a second that my depth perception was completely fucked. And I was looking at a plane way in the sky, but absolutely not. I, it, it was flying um, uh, slow enough to where I saw it for minutes. I got like at least a couple minutes where it was just, you know, going really slow, lurking over my, uh, uh, the, the roof and going into the street and everything. And uh, like I said, silent, and it just had a red light on one uh, corner, a blue light on the other corner, and then the giant white light, like a giant orb that took up most of the attention in the center. And, uh, and it just kept slowly going. And then it disappeared over the uh, uh, fun fact for anyone interested in UFOs. Um, Anytime I saw them, or I actually had friends who saw them too, I wasn't just the only one. Um, they always disappeared over the Chugach mountain range, which is outside of Anchorage. So I don't know what the significance is there, but we always saw them going in that direction. And there was other times where there was one where it looked like a shooting star. It was really far up, but I saw it. So it was flying as fast as a shooting star. And then it did a 90 degree angle turn. Blew my mind. I don't know what, yeah. It, absolutely crazy and the last time is it was on the side of the road I was actually with a friend we we're driving home and we were it's one of those like commonly used roads but it's still like a wooded highly wooded area and uh it was also it was like 1 a.m or something and um we saw the same thing it was just above the treetops and it uh it was lighting up like um the the white light was blinking on and off and like it would light for like a second and then go off for like five seconds so we could get really intense the light was so intense and bright that it looked like daytime around it it was wild and we could see like the triangle it was like a bulbous it was like rounded but it had the points it was the same kind of thing and we couldn't follow it because it was in the woods and so we just kept driving and just watched it trail and disappear and to this day i have no idea what any of it is because i would like to think it's government but if you think about what the government would be doing with any of this it doesn't make any sense these things are just floating around neighborhoods and tree lines and doing for what what purpose there's no like it's a real head scratcher so that's what got me into ufology because i still have no idea like i don't necessarily think that those were et's I don't know. I know that they're, cl they're classically unidentified though. That's for sure. So there, yeah, it's always, always been a head scratcher to me. Well, I believe it because uh, your exact experience about the triangle was the exact one I've heard three times on this show from three different people. So, and wow. exactly the same description. So that just confirmed it in my fucking head. Uh, my buddy, Ben, we just got done talking earlier today about, um, aliens and all this type of stuff my theory is two things he's a bigfoot fan love him to death good guy. <laughs> um, my theory on bigfoot is either he's interdimensional like you have to take something to see him or mm -hmm. it might have a chameleon type of, uh, attribute to him that's able to blend into the woods where you can't really find him because woods are usually thick where they talk about describing seeing him or it's like maybe the aliens are on this, like looking down and like scan the earth. What's a common animal down there that people wouldn't freak out if they saw? 
gorillas and then they just never updated their costume they're like dude your costume like you could tell from up close that you're like not as a costume you're an alien and it's like they're so dumb they wouldn't even know and then that's how they think of us that but, is like a great adult swim show right there i want to watch that but um <laughs> the the triangle thing i've been talking about it is it's like a two dimension they were able to manufacture a two dimension in a three dimension world but probably in their spaceship whatever that triangle is it's flat inside of it is just like being in a room a regular three-dimensional room it's probably got plenty of space but they found a way to blend in to be not because to think that they haven't been here is just idiotic i mean mm -hmm. the fact that people are like why are they showing up now it's like no they've shown up for ages it's just how much how many times have we caught them how many times has social media or technology been at this realm i mean now they're starting to be able to figure out that there's other dimensions out there where me and you exist in another dimension they're starting to to dive into that there's a podcast with brian green on joe rogan where he studies it he's a physicist mm, he's studying yeah. all these dimensions and things it's nuts dude i know and it's funny because anytime you hear anybody encounter or talk about an alien experience they're like why is why is it so like ominous and it's like how the fuck would you explain a triangle in the sky and make it sound like it's a clear cut thing in front of your face it does not make any sense i mm -hmm. bet you i have seen that same exact thing because i've looked up at the stars at night i have a huge ego issue so what i do is i usually disable like compliments when someone gives me i'm like no thank you i don't need it because it's going to feed my ego i want to keep excelling to be better and to only do that is to think that i'm at the low so yeah, i like to look up in the stars at night and i like to when i feel like everything is so in my face or everything is so like infatuated like all my problems are the biggest thing in the world i like to look at how small i am compared to the grand scheme of things that there's I'm this little speck of the speck of the speck of the speck in this grand aspect of things. But I remember mm, looking yeah. up at the stars one time and I would move and it would seem like something was in the way, but it was like showing me the sky still like a triangle. Like I could tell there was like an edge to it where I was like, what the fuck is, and I would move and I could see like a, a it, it, slowly it's like my vision was cracked like like when you see a little squiggly like there's a on everybody's eyes if you pay attention to it there's a little squiggly line that's on your eye line you don't see it because it just blends into your everyday vision but if you notice it the, the line keeps going down and down and down it's like an eye boogie kind of type thing yeah it's always there 100 you just totally ignore it so when i saw this thing it was like my vision was cracked and i was like what the fuck is but it was so clear cut and i could move and i could see the dimension of it where i'm like what the fuck is that? And it, you just confirmed it. I'm just, I'm just saying that's three <laughs> people that have never met each other. I guarantee you, you've never listened to their episodes. And I know yeah. for a fact, you wouldn't be able to recount it, but you just said it like the exact same way they have. So I'm just saying anybody that's out there, that's a non-believer fucking, we need to get a documentary going like now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where, where were their sightings? Do you know? Like what states? My one buddy is out in California. I don't know exactly where he saw his at. Um, okay. All on the West Coast, though. So yeah, fun. it's interesting. The other two were West Coast as well, too. They, they they don't know each other either. That's the weird part is so like I've heard their stories throughout like a year and a half of like just the past episodes. I mean, wow. I post one a day, so we're talking about oh, like nice. episode three hundred to episodes. 450 to episode 670 something to 700 and whatever and then now you heading up to where the 800 is it's like that's such a big gap where it's like that's you're not going to go that like if you're a new guest you're not going to go 10 episodes in you're not going to go 100 200 you're not just going to scroll through <laughs> the thing and be like i'm going to pick this 327 <laughs> yeah. when i'm at fucking <laughs> almost 800 you're going to pick the one that's closest so you know what it's about a little bit so that's right. just that confirms it, bro. I'm freaking, I'm, 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 I want to smoke crack. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want to, I will, I just, it boggles my mind. Cause I'm like, why can't they just come down and be like, Hey man, you know too much. I'm like, I'm on the right track. At least. <laughs> like, at least give me some credit. I figured you guys out or something. It's like the Da Vinci code when Tom Hanks was running down like chapel after chapel. I'm like, this man's on a mission. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. See, I think it's, um, in the long run with questions like this, like the UFOs and things, I think, um, yeah, it's anybody's guess as to what all the fine details of it are, but the fact that something's going on is undeniable, is so undeniable, and that there's something like, you know, I'm sure some skeptics would say, 
you know, there might be something going on, but it's probably just like group mind hallucinations or something. But you like, guys have an in no. contact with each other and then you guys aren't even around each other. And then it's to so the guy who told me his alien encounter happened when he was in his like mid twenties and he's like 40 something now. So it's the exact same thing, just different time periods where I'm just like, yo, they don't know each other. There's no group experience. There's no group high. Yeah. Like I could see Bigfoot, like, Okay, he might be in a spirit animal, maybe group high. Everyone explains seeing something like that or whatever. I don't know. It's and that's actually, um, you know, to talk about Bigfoot, like I am actually, and I have the same kind of outlook on UFOs that I do with cryptids, where I think to anybody's guess what the deal is, I think that it might be less physical than a lot of people think. But Kraken I still think is that a whale it's... penis. I'm letting you know that now. I'm 100% <laughs> a fan of the Kraken. But then someone, uh, a marine biologist, told me it's a cra it's a whale's penis, and I was like, "What?" And it's the picture of the Loch Ness monster, and then a whale uh, mating. It's it it looks a hundred percent identical, and I'm like, <laughs> to think when the kraken was first discovered was during the pirate eras. If it's not a colossal squid, they're looking at that. Imagine a bunch of drunk pirates on a ship spending months on sea, and their only drink is fucking liquor. They're drunk yeah. on a ship and one dude goes Grr! and just starts freaking out like it's a Kraken. And then they're jumping off the boat and killing themselves because they can't swim because they're hammered and they're thinking it's all of a Kraken. I'm like, and that's the one I wanted to be a hundred percent. I made a fucking shirt about it. And it's like, oh, okay, that just whatever. I, science is good, but don't tell <laughs> me that doesn't you, exist. I got so upset. I cried. I feel you. Yeah. You know, it. sea monsters are, are fascinating. I'm, there's because there's like always some vague possibility like maybe it's like again maybe it's probably not as clear cut as the the legends would think but it's kind of like a uh, space in a way where like there's still so much of it unexplored there could be there, there's got to be some weird stuff out there like it took so long to just find the giant squid people thought that that was a legend for a while yeah. so yeah it's it um to be determined um, we say to be determined yeah, man. Um, and uh, it's actually the whole idea of Bigfoot being like this kind of like interdimensional, like spirit thing is um, actually a fairly common Native American belief, uh, especially on the West Coast. I've heard that before. So um, I think that there's some relevance to it. You know, like you, it, it's becoming more and more common the idea like hell i've even heard joe rogan say it at this point um many times by now like that um albeit in in somewhat different terms um you know like the there there's probably some sort of um there's probably some sort of gray area between the subjective and the objective and uh, where the lines start to blur and imagination starts to really take hold in um, in the in the physical world in ways that maybe we can't quite yet explain and um, you know honestly this there's so many uh, uh, rabbit holes that we could go down from here because the way I look at it with these things I think that you know it's like the the like twilight zone um, opening where the say like there's a fifth dimension of existence in the imagination and and there's uh it's I like to use the term like transphysical it might not exactly be objectively physical but um, there um, certain things happen um, you know even like under hypnotic sessions and stuff where you can trick yourself into um, like false memories it, yeah exactly and then at a certain point where it's important because false memories can lead you down bad rabbit holes and things. So like, it's, it's important to understand, very important to understand the distinction between subjective and objective, because if you blur those lines, that's literally the definition of psychosis. That's how you fall down major rabbit holes. But if you can understand that there's like a lot of value in both, because just in today's empirical scientism era, I am a huge advocate of science, but as science almost becomes dogmatized and like this pseudo like meta cult mentality and um yeah i'm a, i'm against that too um we're gonna have to break this up into two parts bro because we can't hit them with alien science and then bigfoot and then 
people are going to be like, what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, I'm man. always game for more, man. Dude. There's always plenty to talk about. Uh, we'll get you on again for sure, man. We've been going on for an hour. Um, uh, where can people find you, man? I want to, oh, you're definitely coming back. Cause we're going to have, I'll actually think about getting you and my other alien buddy in a podcast together. See if we could talk about these experiences. Cause I'm pretty sure you both would freaking. That sounds like it. a lot of fun. I'm totally in. Just let me know when. And, um, People can, um, you can go to my website. It's uh, divemind.net and you can find all, all my material there. You could get my book. There's a, a, a purchase link on the website, but you can find that on Amazon, um, uh, Kindle or uh, paperback. And it's Dive Manual, Empirical Investigations of Mysticism. But uh, yeah, I got like um, an excerpt because I also talk about uh, sleep paralysis a bit too and like how we're talking you, about that next time write that down sleep yeah. paralysis I'll tell you that we'll, one yeah we'll do so you can actually find a, a free excerpt of uh, my sleep paralysis uh, some of my sleep paralysis work on the website and like I said there's interviews where I'll do deep dives on cults or serial killers or demonology so there's I try to keep I don't have like my own show so I, uh, whenever I come on like someone else's show, I try to really, uh, give them both barrels with some fun stuff to talk about. So I, and I try to mix it up. So there's a lot of stuff you can find out for anybody who's interested. And, uh, thanks a lot for having me on. I really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun, man. I'll make sure I link everything in the description and thank you for listening to this episode out of the blank podcast.